So how do you define social web? I'm assuming it goes beyond Twitter and Facebook, right? Right. It's, it's admittedly somewhat of a slippery notional um, entity. And the way I like to think of it, I, I almost think of the social web as a heat map. So the entire web is inherently social. It was designed to be that way. You're going to communicate with others. That's the whole point of sharing information. I think right now when people think social web, the mind share tends to go to Facebook, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, um, to other sites uh, like that because they offer APIs as platforms that make the data really accessible. Mm -hmm. And naturally that's going to get the attention because there's the least amount of friction involved in going and getting some interesting data to go do some analysis with. So I would recommend you not think of it as a Venn diagram where you have the web and then you carve out the social web somehow. Yeah. I think it's really all the social web and it's just that there's some hot spots and some, some good hubs right now that are much hotter than others. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to set the tone for other web properties moving forward, especially uh, if, you know, if they want users to be hacking on their data mm -hmm. and trying to do interesting things with their platforms. So what types of questions can you ask and answer from social data? So you, you kind of have this practical what you can do today, and then you have this theoretical well, what could you ever do. Mm -hmm. uh, today you can definitely um, look at, say, Twitter data, for example. You can say, well, what's my influence? Um, who is so-and-so particularly connected to? Uh, one of the more interesting things I've looked at in my book is I look at all of Tim O'Reilly's friendships, mm -hmm. and I, I find the clicks in his friendship network. And so you, you tend to find that... Um, you tend to find that there's 26 or so cliques that are very large, and there's a foundational group of people in these cliques that are in every one of these maximum cliques. And so it's interesting because, you know, if you're at this conference and you can't get Tim O'Reilly's attention maybe and you really want to, mm. well, it would make sense. Go find one of these other people who are, who are in these cliques because they're so uh, tightly connected, not just with Tim, but with all of his other friends. Yeah. Uh, that's an example. You can look at where your professional network uh, resides geographically. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would want to consider that uh, in a career decision. Uh, if all of your network is in Silicon Valley in Boston and you live somewhere else yeah. and there's a few other uh, professional acquaintances you have in between, it might make sense to see that on a map and start to think, well, would I want to put myself in a position where I have a lot of options uh, or not? Um, you can answer a lot more than you would think just, just using basic Twitter data, LinkedIn data, yeah. Facebook data. And then you have this theoretical aspect of you know, the whole semantic web. Um, where you get into inference. Mm -hmm. And so what I think is going to be really interesting is to see how we take all of these gobs uh, of social data that are piling up all over the place and have the semantic web folks start to hack on them and try to do some inference. So you might get certain facts from LinkedIn, mm -hmm. certain facts from Facebook and, and other places, blog data for example. Um, those are facts and that's great, but what if you can start to infer new facts from facts you already know in other places. Right. So that's what I'm particularly interested in looking at over the next few years as that starts to mature a little more with social data. So what type of programming or development experience do you need to do, like what you did with Tim's uh, Twitter feed, I'm assuming, is, 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 is followers, though. Yeah, so, so admittedly, um, so my background's in computer science. I would, I would consider myself a computer scientist, and I've done a lot of development. I'm going to be slightly biased in giving you a, a sort of programming-centric sure, answer. Sure, sure. Uh -huh. But what I would say is that um, the bar is not as high as you might think. Um, in, in the book I wrote, Mining the Social Web, I use Python is the primary language. It's mm -hmm. really the only language. And the great thing about it is that it's practically pseudocode. Um, you don't have to write a big program. You don't have to become an expert. You can practically learn it as you go along. It's an interpreted language. Mm -hmm. So with very little effort, you can use Twitter's RESTful API in this case. You can get data just with literally a few lines of code. And there's a lot of good toolkits and packages. So in the case of analyzing the friendship data, no kidding, it was probably 20 lines or so of code in right. total. Uh, <laughs> not a lot of uh, right. work involved. You just have to look at your tools and pick them carefully. And so if you're a programmer mm -hmm. uh, and you have a great background in programming, I guess um, you could pick just about anything you'd like. Uh, if you're more of a business analyst or someone who's not 
totally comfortable. Um, there are tools popping up left and right, uh, some of them here at the conference, you know, that you might look into, but I would definitely not rule out taking Python or Ruby or a very easy to pick up language. Mm -hmm. um, I think right now that's somewhat essential because a big part of the work is in getting the data. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised at how much time you spend just getting the data so that you can do very simple analysis on it. Interesting. Programming really helps with that. I, I bet. So I know that you have a, uh, an unusual distribution method that you're using with this. Why, why did you opt to use GitHub? So the cool thing about GitHub is that it's a social coding repository. So in addition to um, having my code in a place where it's very accessible to everyone, there's this community that kind of grows up around projects on GitHub. And so I, I get the benefit now of not having my code in a tarball that someone downloads from a website right. and me having to maintain. I get to maintain it in a very transparent way mm -hmm. on GitHub. People get to take it and improve it if they want to, maybe fix bugs, maybe make it better, maybe expand it. Right. And you see these, um, these people kind of band together and start to follow each other on GitHub. On GitHub, you can watch other developers, and, and similar to how you would follow someone on Twitter, mm -hmm. and you'd be surprised at, at the, the synergy that kind of comes from taking people who care about projects and, and having that sort of explicit connection between them. Right. And so it has great, um, it, it's great in the sense that it makes the maintenance for me as an author, maintaining my code for the book easier, mm -hmm. but it's really connecting people together that, that's this uh, really interesting additional layer. Um, the book's about social data, sure. maintain the, the code in a social way. Right. I just, I was really happy uh, when I kind of connected those dots and thought, you know, GitHub would be perfect for this. Yeah, it makes sense. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Appreciate this, it. This is awesome. Great conference, and I really loved getting to chat with you. Great, thank you.